morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all the senior consultants from inside the hospital and uh, from the city of Pimbatu, and uh, doctors from our uh, Sri Ramakrishna Hospital and uh, outside in the city of uh, Pimbatu, who so have logged in uh, to this uh, webinar today. And I welcome all of you on behalf of the management of Sri Ramakrishna Hospital uh, for sparing your time and uh, uh, taking your efforts to attend the webinar today. And uh, I would like to thank our uh, speakers of today for uh, participating in this uh, webinar. And uh, spending their uh, time for uh, preparing and uh, now for presenting and uh, being ready to answer your uh, queries. And our first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Charada Jagannathan, who is a well-known uh, obstetrician in the city of Coimbatore, uh, highly qualified and uh, she is a consultant uh, specialist in obstetric medicine and uh, she has taken a novel topic of uh, obstetric medicine its premise and uh, promise so i was discussing with her uh, some few days ago and uh, even today i had uh, my own doubts about the topic because i couldn't understand the topic fully so I got it clear and uh, she is going to deal about uh, the, the obstetric medicine itself, a broad uh, speciality, subspeciality in uh, OG. So obstetric medicine gives so many, I mean, promises to so many uh, complicated uh, deliveries so gives promises to mothers to have a normal pregnancy in spite of their uh, morbidities and uh, she was explaining to me and uh, probably her lecture will uh, deal with and uh, you can uh, hear straight from uh, Dr. Sharda Tenor. and it's uh, premises <coughs> uh, actually the Obstetric medicine in this context, it has uh, uh, actually spread into so many, I mean, uh, subspecialties. And uh, with the uh, presence of a uh, multi specialty hospital like this, I mean, like Ramakrishna Hospital, and with the uh, availability of uh, many specialists, and uh, they are able to get. Uh, the help of uh, so many uh, specialities <clears throat> to deal with any problem arising in obstetric medicine. And uh, she is going to deal with uh, this topic, obstetric medicine, its premises and the promises. And uh, Dr. Suja Maria, she is uh, again uh, a proud consultant of uh, Sri Ramakrishna Hospital. In fact, uh, both are very, very proud consultants of uh, uh, Ramakrishna Hospital. And uh, Dr. Suja has done her uh, DM uh, neonatology from uh, Chandigarh. And uh, <clears throat> she has done her MD pediatrics from uh, Maripal. And uh, she is a consultant neonatologist in our hospital. And uh, on the eve of uh, the breast, World Breastfeeding Week, which we celebrated uh, last week, as a continuation, I think, she is going to deal with uh, breastfeeding. Is it difficult today? So her uh, topic also will be interesting to many uh, logicians and pediatricians. So I think uh, both the topics will be useful to the audiences. And. Uh, now I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Sharada Jagannathan uh, to take the stage. Thank you. Dr. Sharada. Yes, sir. 
so thank you very much sir good evening all in this next 20 minutes i would be talking about obstetric medicine a sub speciality of obstetrics as sir correctly said the extent the premise and the scope the promises of obstetric medicine even now and in earlier days you see any senior consultant or professor in obstetrics and gynecology for visiting card or cv would read dr sd md dnb mnams specialist in high risk pregnancy fertility laparoscopic surgery done so versatile they were and they were able to help all the female patients but now like any other discipline of medicine we also have lot of ramifications in obstetrics and i would talk about the sub speciality obstetric medicine with a couple of case scenarios and then touch upon the crux of the obstetric medicine let's see this case this patient a 22 year old mother was married for one year came to us because she had two pregnancy losses in the second sitting, when we spoke to her, very slowly she came out telling us that she had a non-healing ulcer that went into gangrene. She was, she was having low saturation, admitted into the ICU. And when they did the biopsy of the ulcer, they found histiocytic and lymphocytic infiltration, suggestive of connective tissue disorder, and the investigations proved to be SLE. She had SLD, ANA positive, double standard DNA positive, lupus anticoagulant, and anticardiolipin positive. With this profile, she was on immunosuppression. And soon after marriage, she stopped all these medications. The family completely unaware, and she embarked on pregnancy. The next case. This patient. A 40-year-old who was just having mild headache, which she had not told anybody for past one week, developed seizures early in the morning. She was taken to the peripheral hospital, where there also she threw recurrent seizures. So she was referred to Ramakrishna Hospital. She was received in the emergency, received parenteral anti-epileptic and sedative. In spite of it, she threw seizures again. She was ventilated because she was desaturating. In, when she was taken into the ICU, the junior most doctor found that she was having a prolapsed uterus. So they called us. By the time we could come, she had expelled the baby, and only we knew that it was totally undiagnosed pregnancy. She's having eclampsia with status epilepticus. This is another case which was referred to us as acute fatty liver of pregnancy. 22 year old mother, 32 weeks gestation. She had raised bilirubin. Serum transaminases were in the fold of thousands. It was referred on a Saturday evening as acute fatty liver of pregnancy. With these three cases, let's see what this obstetric medicine means. As I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of ramifications in this discipline where many choose not to do obstetrics after doing three years of obstetrics and gynecology postgraduate. They take into reproductive medicine and practice only fertility, which includes endocrine as well. Or some people have interest just for surgery. So they stick on to gynecology. They're all surgical oncologists who does only gynecology surgeries. And some people do minimal invasive surgeries where they do endogynec and urogynecology. The left is the maternal fetal medicine, which deals with the sort of obstetric medicine. And more importantly, they also learn how to monitor the baby because the fetus is now also an individual, sometimes a patient. So both put together, we have the maternal and fetal medicine. You may think, is an internal medicine not sufficient? A person who's not tuned to obstetrics, an internal medicine may not suffice. 
and the obstetrician who is unaware of these medical disorders in pregnancy also may find it difficult to deal with a subset of groups. So we need an obstetric physician who is the crux for the obstetric medicine team. At Ramakrishna Hospital, we have like so most of the consultants are finely tuned. They are uh, not naive. They are well in line with this obstetric patients, especially like Shelly and Sir in surgery, Dr. Sarvesh and Sir. They do better than us obstetrics. And because of them, we are able to give uh, a very good optimum results for this complicated pregnant mothers. And obviously, when we learn fetal medicine also, it makes us a comprehensive maternal fetal medicine consultant. Why this I'm talking? Because an internal medicine may not be suffice who's not tuned to pregnancy is because this pregnant mother, there is a lot of overlap between the normal and abnormal. A normal pregnant mother can look breathless, she can have fetal edema, she will have tachycardia, then uh, even this in, uh, mammary chauffule will be there, they can have systolic murmurs. So they will, it's so difficult to distinguish between a pathology and the physiology. And even blood work when we do, it's very common to see leukocytosis to the extent of 25,000 after delivery, after maternal corticosteroids, even otherwise. They obviously have waste, ESR. All these things, it puts a new and intensivist or an intern to look vague at these pregnant mothers. Again, there are difficulties for this pregnant mother in terms of imaging. Imaging because of radiation exposure or the pregnant fe uh, the fetus itself can be an obstacle in imaging and fear for mother also. Similarly, prescription. The pharmacokinetics, dynamics is all altered so much in pregnancy that the medications, prescription in medication also requires a skill. And most importantly, these mothers are very hesitant to take medications. They always think of thalidomide tragedy or they think mermaids when we give even a simple paracetamol or we give an anti-allergic medications. There are profound anatomical changes in these mothers. They walk with waddling gait. They'll have fetal edema. They'll have pubic diastasis, severe pain with no pathology and uh, there is alteration in the immunology which may be in the next slide i would tell and uh, uh, recent um, statistics in kerala have shown in 10 years they have 23 suicidal deaths in the mother pregnant mothers and immunology we also have realized among covid patients pregnant mothers had more morbidity and mortality so obstetric medicine deals with medical disorders which means that it's not a single man show. It is done in a, as a comprehensive setup in a tertiary care center or as our Professor Dean said, quaternary center with inputs from all these people, but at the same time, not leaving the core obstetric so that we don't deviate from what is necessary. Some uh, conditions are worth mentioning is this unique to pregnancy. These hypertensive disorders, fatty liver, Dermatological afflictions, many times they'll tell it is vasculitis, but then if you see it would be just a pregnancy associated articarial uh, papules, it can be just a simple pup. And gestational diabetes is equally difficult because in earlier stages, because of nausea vomiting, they have hypoglycemia. Later stages, because of uteroplacental insufficiency, they have hypoglycemia. So these are all very unique to pregnancy. Some people already are at risk for becoming pregnant because it will endanger their life. One is these uh, autoimmune diseases. Definitely autoimmune disease, if these women are able to become pregnant and take home a baby, it is because of joint consultation with the rheumatologist and the nephrologist. Same is with hypertension and thrombosis. It's not uncommon to see women with previous venous thromboembolism now becoming pregnant or women with congenital heart disease, valve replacements on anticoagulants. And previous years and all, when I used to study in college, we used to see only rheumatic heart disease. Now we see all mothers with congenital heart disease being corrected, corrected tetralogy or transposition. We see such with uh, um, the ASB, VSB closure, so many things we see becoming pregnant. So obstetric medicine, this team, the obstetric physician plays a very important role. 
starting from preconception, going through pregnancy, and most importantly, puperium. Without these people, I don't think the diabetic mothers can become pregnant. Otherwise, uncontrolled diabetes can lead to anomalies in the baby, can lead to intrauterine fetal death, fetal acidosis, and can kill the mother also. Epilepsy is same. There are cases of epilepsy not treated properly, mothers having sudden death in these epileptic mothers, and anticoagulants on women on antihypertensives, thyrotoxicosis, all sorts of nephritis without the uh, our joint consultation with the respective uh, specialist will not be able to take them to an optimum outcome. Very importantly, puparium, because previously we used to see mothers having problems before pregnancy or during delivery, but now we see we discharge them. And especially now with this early work of early discharge, sometimes we see mothers coming back broad dead. Why broad dead? A cardiomyopathy was missed or they have the cerebral venous thrombosis. It can be all these things which can cause, where it can be very detrimental. And thyroiditis, we see a lot of subclinical hypothyroidism and if they have thyroiditis also, we think, oh, she's got a newborn young child, mother, baby, not sleeping, therefore not eating, sleeplessness, losing weight, but then it can be a thyroiditis also. And most dreaded is, as I mentioned earlier, pulmonary embolism. So this brings puperium and postpartum thromboprophylaxis. Cardiac disease, no, nothing less. Cardiac disease can be very detrimental during and after delivery. And after delivery, because the cardiac output, which has been 7 liters, coming back to 5 liters, there is a lot of influx from the extravascular to the intravascular compartment. So without the, the intensive care and these cardiologist, physician, and the nephrologist, it is uh, very difficult to take these women safely through pregnancy, childbirth. So going back quickly to the first case where I told a recurrent miscarriage because of SLE and secondary APLA, this patient had been on immunosuppressants but discontinued soon after marriage. After that, she also had transverse myelitis. She was, in, uh, she was unable to walk she had severe weakness of both lower limbs. He was treated by a rheumatologist with immunosuppressants. Then he brought the lowest medications possible with prednisolone, acetoyoprine, hydroxychloroquine, folic acid, and told this, yes, now you can attempt pregnancy. She, attempt, uh, she attempted pregnancy, became pregnant, and we added low molecular weight heparin and low dose aspirin because she was SLE with secondary antiphospholipid antibodies. She went through pregnancy very safely. There was no hypertension. There was no IUGR. She delivered a healthy child at term. And this was possible only because of the rheumatologist, the obstetric medicine. Otherwise, she couldn't have dreamt of a baby. And having had transverse myelitis, she almost went to the uh, coffin and then but came back alive just to have a baby with us. The second case. The second case, real story, which happened here at our hospital, this patient undiagnosed pregnancy having had eclampsia but then she came back because once we told that it is because of pregnancy then she told after six months her blood pressure she was chronic hypertensive her bp was corrected we did all tests has been done to rule out other underlying autoimmune and to rule out uh, other causes for uh, hypertension it was well planned pregnancy and this time at the age of 42 she delivered a live born baby at term the third case where I told was referred as acute fatty liver in pregnancy. We looked at her very carefully. Yes, she had elevated bilirubin 3.6. Transaminases were very high. But she never had low fibrinogen or no hypoglycemia. Most striking thing, she was complaining of pruritus of palms and soles. Her viral screen was negative. Ultrasound showed gal gallbladder calculate, but no obstruction. There was no blood pressure. So clearly we came that it is not an AFLP, it is not HELP syndrome. It is intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, 32 weeks. We put her on use of deoxycholic acid, continued the pregnancy, and delivered her at term. So obstetric medicine, unlike the previous years where mothers died because of blood loss or because of abortions and sepsis, now mothers have a lot of reasons for um, morbidity and mortality is obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and we've even seen mothers like thalassemia major 
also becoming pregnant. Then, as I mentioned earlier, heart disease and transplant recipients. Now we also have women with bariatric surgeries or with liver transplant people uh, coming for pregnancy, where we initially used to see only with renal transplants. So the list keeps going continuously. And without a team effort, I don't think uh, this obstetric medicine, a new specialty, but then very important, the changing profile. Plus, we have to add all our other uh, colleagues who come in time. And most importantly, the NICU backup. Without the NICU backup and the parents' willingness to spend for these small neonates, this obstetric medicine will not be promising. Thank you for your patient listening. I thank Dean, sir, for this opportunity and the hospital, the management, and all my colleagues and uh, the other uh, disciplines who are always helping us in times of need. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sharda, for your excellent uh, exposition. Thank you, sir. And next, uh, I'd like to call upon uh, Dr. Suja Mariam. And Dr. Suja, please. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, one and all. So uh, after that uh, intense obstetric session where we had a bunch of interesting obstetric medical and obstetric cases, uh, this is actually a lighter topic, but uh, uh, a chronic topic that we all have been discussing for years together. So uh, I wanted to discuss on breastfeeding in the current uh, generation, whether has it become so difficult to achieve optimal breastfeeding rates. Now, uh, the ta objective of this discussion is just a light discussion to understand the changes in breastfeeding, knowledge, attitude, and practices in the newer generation mothers whom we are handling. So, I'm Dr. Suja Maria. I'm a neonatologist at Sri Ramakrishna Hospital. I uh, developed my interest in the field of breastfeeding after I joined here. And uh, with that interest, I have uh, uh, got a certification as an advanced certified lactation professional. Or, uh, professional. And related to the topic, I did my postgraduate diploma in pediatric nutrition also. And these two courses gave me a lot of insight to the breastfeeding uh, problems the current generation women are facing. Now, uh, there is always a norm where, uh, in which the society thinks that it is uh, the medical practitioners are the ones who discourage breastfeeding and who encourage infant formula supplementation. But we know that it is not right. Uh, the current uh, World Breastfeeding Week's uh, uh, statement was to support and educate mothers to breastfeed. It has established 10 steps for successful breastfeeding in hospital. And we all know that we all are breastfeeding friendly. We all strive to achieve all 10 steps of uh, the breastfeeding friendly hospital. But we all face some practical problems. There was a recent study in uh, uh, done by the uh, Milo company. So that was published in Times of India, the Chennai edition. It was just published during the breastfeeding week celebrations. This was a survey which was conducted over 1,200 mothers across India. Now this study revealed that 83% of these mothers expressed that they have major problems in breastfeeding. So they are not happy with their breastfeeding status. 50% of these mothers have physical breastfeeding problems. So there is something documented. They have cracked nipples, sore nipples, breast engorgement, painful breastfeeding. They have physical problems. 66% of them seek help from families, 33% from online videos, and only 7% from lactation consultants or any medical professionals. 56% did not feel that their milk is sufficient for their baby. And it was surprising to see that 40% of mothers were using breast pumps. These were healthy mother and baby diets who were being discharged from hospital and were at home. So 40% of these mothers were using breast pumps. Now to achieve breastfeeding success, to make breastfeeding successful in hospital and after discharge, it is actually a multi-dimensional uh, topic. So there are uh, multiple uh, uh, changes that will affect the breastfeeding success in a mother and baby diet. One is a physician perspective. Yes. 
some babies infant formula supplementation is started in hospital or after discharge by a physician maybe it is because of the increased awareness regarding the complications of breastfeeding failure we are all worried about hypoglycemia excessive weight loss hypernatremia jaundice failure to thrive these are now become major problems when we are following up a baby this is an age of litigation do you want to support breastfeeding suppose if a baby develops hypoglycemia or if the baby develops some problem of dehydration you are responsible even though you had done everything to support breastfeeding you are responsible so this increased awareness has made physicians to uh, not to take the risk of uh, providing extended exclusive breastfeeding support so even when there is a small problem we all tend towards choosing infant formula over, rather than breastfeeding Next, the mother and child physiology. Is it actually changing? Are our mothers having an increased incidence of lactation insufficiency as they feel? Or it is just psychological? And the effect of social media, which is happening currently nowadays. All of them are contributing to the recent changes in breastfeeding rates within our mothers. This was a study we conducted in our hospital. So this is actually an enormous data of over two and a half years. So uh, we start, try to strive to improve the breastfeeding rates within a hospital rather than the rates we wanted to improve our breastfeeding supports to our inborn babies. So we created a team of uh, lactation counseling nurses. We started working on our finer points of breastfeeding, like early initiation of breastfeeding, prolonged skin to skin care, uh, early expression of breast milk. We started working on these finer points. And uh, we restricted the use of non-medical use of formula. Like uh, we made specific indications when infant formula is to be given. And uh, we identified breastfeeding nurses in each of these wards and uh, uh, trained them so that they can provide support to the mothers even during the night hours. We started with an exclusive breastfeeding rate of around 40% in hospital. That is in the 72 hours they are in within hospital. 40% of the babies were exclusively breastfed. Once we started involving our nurses and we started focusing on improving quality of breastfeeding support, we were able to achieve a rate of 80%. As our breastfeeding support continued, we were able to sustain the rate of more than 80%, but please note we were never able to achieve 100%. And then we made some relaxations in the guidelines saying that if a mother demands formula, even if there is no medical indication, we can accept her decision. We can discuss with her about the harms of infant formula. If she says, yes, I want supplementation for my baby, that we can give it to the baby in hospital. So once we started making this relaxation in use of infant formula, you see that other, other, again, the exclusive breastfeeding rates started slowly coming down. Now it is almost six months, so we don't know how the breastfeeding rates will continue. So we learned two things. One, whatever we do, there are some babies who are going to land up with infant formula. 100% exclusive breastfeeding is not practically possible. Two, uh, once you give them an option, there are a chunk of mothers who want to use infant formula or who do not want to exclusively breastfeed even during the initial few days within hospital. So why is it? Is the maternal physiology changing? Why are we not able to achieve 100% breastfeeding at, even within the hospital itself? Is lactation insufficiency an endemic problem now? Because whenever we go for rounds, so one day complain the mother says is palpatella, there is no sufficient milk. Baby is crying, there is no drop of milk, no milk is coming. So we keep telling them it is just psychological. You start loving the baby, you start handling the baby, you start getting milk. But is lactation insufficiency increasing within the mothers? Uh, the problem is there is no specific definition of lactation insufficient. No one knows how much milk a day one mother or a day two mother is going to produce. Probably the incidence of lactation insufficiency is increasing because of the other medical problems. One in 10 mothers today have PCOS. One in eight have some thyroid dysfunction. There is a sudden increase in pre-diabetes, diabetes and insulin resistance. I uh, read some data saying that one in three of the pregnant mothers are either pre-diabetic or having frank gestational diabetes mellitus. All these hormones are going to affect breastfeeding finally through the prolactin factor. Prolactin levels in multiple studies have been shown to be inversely related to the waist circumference. And we know that all our mothers, even in pre-pregnancy state, they are having higher BMIs. And during pregnancy, we don't have to think that BMI shoots up to sky levels. It is inversely related to age. Now, at most predominantly, our mothers are between the 29 to 35 year age group. Prolactin levels are significantly lower in PCOS patients also. 
we have a bunch of diagnosed PCOS patients, but we also have a bunch of undiagnosed PCOS patients who uh, are able to get pregnant and land up with them in, uh, during delivery only. The major blame is on C-section. Does C-section affect prolactin release? When you go for water, you say she has undergone C-section, that's why she's not producing milk. But surprisingly, there are many studies which are done on prolactin levels after C-section. Um, most studies show there is no difference in the prolactin levels at two hours. Immediately after C-section, prolactin levels per same both in C-section and normal vaginal delivery. There was one recent study which was conducted in Turkey uh, among 164 mothers, which actually showed that prolactin levels were higher in LSES babies at two hours after delivery. That means the hormonal changes are happening equally well in LSES babies also, in mothers also. The placenta is removed and the prolactin level is shooting up. But what they discovered was that after the first day, after during the second day or third day, when the copious amount of milk has to be produced, in LSES mother, there is an excessive epinephrine release, which is related to the pain, stress, and hunger. So this epinephrine actually suppresses the oxytocin levels, oxytocin production, so that at the end of 48 hours, when you see the actual amount of milk produced, it is slightly less in C-section mothers when compared to mothers who are delivered vaginally. So probably it is not the process of cesarean, but what happens later after cesarean, which is going to affect the prolactin release in cesarean mothers. Now they have discovered an entity called as isolated glandular hypoplasia. This has happened after uh, the uh, innovations in ultrasound technology and expertise that some mothers, around 1% of the mothers have glandular hypoplasia. They may have normal breast size, their hormonal levels, everything will be normal, but their alveolar, the mammary alveolar will be hypoplastic. They won't be able to produce as much milk as a normal woman, but uh, remember that it is just 1% one, just 1 of the pregnant population. Now, is the maternal psychology uh, changing? So we were talking about physiology, but all these physiological problems have been gradually happening over years. What happened to the current generation mothers psychologically? Now, this is an uh, interesting thing about generations. So uh, uh, earlier, the generation used to change every 30 years. Now they say the generation gap is happening even within every 10 to 15 years. So people who are born between 81 to 96 are called as Generation X. So we used to talk about Generation X. So I'm probably a Generation X. People who are born after 97 uh, uh, are called as Generation Z. So uh, I'm sorry, then 81 to 96 are called as Millennials. So we are now having deliveries or mothers who belong to the Millennial Generation or the Generation Z. Their attitudes, the way they look at life, they, they, the way they solve their problems are quite different when compared to earlier generations. Not only the mother, even the father, the millennial and the generation said they can't fall, they can't fail, they can't wait, they can't accept. Imagine us learning to drive a bicycle. We take the bicycle, we start chasing our friends, we start mimicking what our friends did. We fall, but we hit the fact that we fell, we'll rub our knees and we'll take the bicycle and we try again. But what happens to this generation? They need a knee pad, they need an elbow pad, they need a helmet, they need somebody in the front, they need somebody in the back, and they need somebody to teach them how to put the leg on the pedal, how to drive the pedal. And even if after that they fail, they can't accept they are not able to drive a bicycle. They want to learn by uh, uh, cycling within one day or two days, and they want to win their race also. They can't accept any failure. They are perfectionists. They think everything has to be cured and everything has an immediate and uh, quick solutions. Uh, they are given reward very quickly, even professionally, academically. They are given, they are appreciated so many times that when something is not going as by their expectation, they are not able to accept the failure. So most of the women we are delivering are professionals. They are academically strong. Uh, they, have, uh, they have the perception that they have achieved everything in life. And then you give them a baby and they're not able to manage the baby. They uh, are not able to handle the stress and the sense of failure. Now, is stress, we all talk about stress. Is psychosocial stress affecting our breastfeeding rates in our current mothers? There are scientific research papers again on this topic. 
Uh, this was a recent interesting study which I saw. The psycho effect of psychosocial stress and cortisol stress reactivity predict the breast milk composition. So in this study, they found out that 40% of the women who face breastfeeding problems have at least two major life events in the year prior to delivery. So there you would have had some financial problem or an emotional problem or a partner related problem in the two years. So most of the women are, or at least half of the women who have breastfeeding problems have a recent lifestyle change in the past one year prior to the delivery. Stress, psychosocial stress can affect breastfeeding via the hormonal stress response. Now we all have managed stress. There is something called as an acute stress. There is something called as a chronic stress. Acute stress is when you're uh, facing an accident, when you're chased by somebody, the earlier fright, flight and fright response that we talked about, that is called as acute stress. So when you have an acute stress, there will be an acute rise in cortisol levels. This cortisol mobilizes all the fat from your body and it uh, produce, this fat goes into the breast milk and they have noticed that serum fat, uh, the uh, fatty acid content of the breast milk is higher. That is why mothers who go through a process of labor and deliver have higher fat content in their breast milk. Now there is something called as chronic stress. Chronic stress is a uh, chronic higher level of cortisol levels in our body. For us, even a uh, cell phone ping is a stress. Somebody ringing the calling bell is a stress. Some uh, telephone coming in the middle of the night is a stress. Uh, newspaper not getting delivered in the morning is a stress. The electrician not coming on time is a stress. We all face chronic stress. We have chronically persistent elevated levels of cortisol. This cortisol causes fat deposition rather than fat mobilization. It causes a state of insulin resistance and increases free radicals and blunts response to all other hormones, including the thyroid stimulating hormone and the prolactin. So all our mothers, the millennials, the generation Z, are brought up in a state of chronic state. Though they state that they are happy, they are comfortable, they are in the state of chronic stress. Now, this was the research I mentioned that they started, tried to compare the fat content of the breast milk in women who have less stress and more stress. They had a questionnaire and women who had less stress had better fat content in their breast milk when compared to women in a state of higher stress levels. And then even a detailed study which showed that a lot of these omega fatty acids were lesser in women, uh, the breast milk of women who were in a state of chronic stress. I won't go into the numbers in detail. There were further studies which showed that maternal anxiety prior to delivery has shown to affect the immunoglobulin, sodium and again the fat component in the milk. So this was about the physiology and the psychology of the mother. Now we have a New York pandemic or what we call an epidemic of tongue ties and lip ties. There are a lot of mothers who are learning about breastfeeding techniques, breastfeeding problems online and uh, I started feeling that there is an epidemic of tongue tie. Every baby who has a breastfeeding problem is being diagnosed with a problem called tongue tie. At least I understand the function of tongue. And another problem which is called as a lip tie. Many women are now opting for this tongue tie release and lip tie release. Not only for the milder cases, but for some subtler cases also, they are going for this release. Whether uh, it is just giving them a psychological relief or improvement in breastfeeding, or it is actually giving uh, an improvement in breastfeeding state only years to come we will come to know but uh, this is now one hot topic among breastfeeding mothers they will put show po uh, post pictures of their pictures in online medias and whatsapp groups and ask is my baby having tongue type is my baby having lip type so uh, how to reach out uh, to the mothers who need support we know that our mothers are going to have a lot of breastfeeding problems. They have physiological problems. They are having psychological problems. We are trying to be breastfeeding friendly. We try to do everything in hospital, but still uh, we are not the ones whom they turn to when they have an actual breastfeeding problems. So how can we improve our breastfeeding support to our mothers? We have to remember that this millennial generation of mothers have an access to an average of seven smartphones or devices in an year. Millennial moms spend more time on social networks than they do on television. So uh, the older generation where we had this advertisement and breastfeeding promotion videos on TVs are no longer going to work. Our moms are on social medias only. They on an average spend 17 hours on social media. Moms on Facebook who have just delivered 
check Facebook updates at least seven times a day in the first week after delivery. More than half the moms use social media to seek expert opinion on breastfeeding problems. If they are having a cracked nipple, they are not going to come to us telling I am having cracked nipple. They are going to Google, they are going to Facebook, they are going to ask your friends, I am having cracked nipple, what is to be done? Today's mom, they seek friends' opinions for problems. They all use online reviews for seeking care. So whom to consult when you have a breastfeeding? They go Google and they find out whoever is the first name showing up, they consult that person. The receptacle of traditional counseling and supporting techniques. If you and me are going to go to tell them it will be painful for a week and it is going to be better after that, they are not going to believe us. So if we actually have to help our mothers, if we want to be part of the conversation and help them and support breastfeeding, we have to be where the conversation is actually happening, which is the social media. This is what one point which I wanted to convey during this discussion that we all stick to the traditional methods of being breastfeeding friendly. But probably we have to uh, change our mode of communication. We as breastfeeding uh, supporting practitioners, we also have to be active on social media, not as an individual, but probably as a group where actual good information and support system can be provided to mothers. So we have to accept that breastfeeding is a problem nowadays. We have to stay in touch with our patients even after delivery to provide breastfeeding support. We can choose one of the platforms, either WhatsApp or Facebook or Twitter, where we can provide good breastfeeding support information and suggestions on a day-to-day -day basis. As the time changes, as new information comes, we have to keep updating them. We have to share information, views, and testimonials of mothers who have successfully breastfed. And I think it is high time that every hospital, as a mother's hub, the delivered mothers, the antenatal mothers, we have to create a peer group for the mothers who are delivering within one single hospital. We also have to have realistic goals and targets, 100% breastfeeding, forcing a mother to exclusively breastfeed and ignoring the complaints that they get are not, no longer going to work. So breastfeeding is actually uh, difficult for the current day mothers. We have to have realistic goals and we have to use different modes of communication with our patients to support them in continuing breastfeeding. Thank you. Thank you, Suja. Thank you, sir. And uh, <clears throat> any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, Dr. Suja, it was a very excellent presentation. Too good, too good. I always feel these mothers, the moment you sell your uh, uh, healthcare professional, they don't want to ask us. They want to go to support groups. The support groups in your personal experience, because your special interest is also in breastfeeding, how do you feel? feel? Are they complementary to us or you feel they are not really complementary? And the uh, support groups currently existing are not probably, at the current moment, they are not complementary towards us. We are, because we are excluded from it. Uh, the first thing that happens is the patient and uh, the mothers, they start moving away from us. We don't know what is happening to the mother. We don't know what is happening to a baby until a complication arises. So that is why I felt, personally felt, that we should change our mode of communication. We should become part of the support groups. We should encourage support groups. And when we feel that there is some wrong information is being transferred, then we should be able to guide them that this is not right. We can do it this way. True. I think uh, these childbirth educators or lactation consultants, people are more interested in them rather than the professionals, though they don't mind spending more on those people. Mm. It is probably... Uh, the, it's oh, fascinating. It or, is fascinating. Or, uh, it's exciting for them. It is exciting for them. And uh, uh, the out-of-box out of the box concepts that they provide, mm -hmm. provide uh, it fascinates them actually. When breastfeeding is so multifactorial, when they point out to one tie and say, this is the problem, you solve it, breastfeeding will be better, probably they are getting carried away by it. I accept that there are few mothers who are actually feeling relieved and going through procedures, it's consultations and all. But uh, what happens to the chunk who are getting deviated and uh, from the right path? 
thank you very much. I just wanted you to add one more thing about your uh, this breast uh, milk bank. Uh, yes, in uh, Ramakrishna Hospital, there is now a, a private human milk bank uh, named as Nectar of Life Milk Bank. Uh, we are going to uh, celebrate the first year anniversary of the milk bank. Uh, it was uh, established in association with Rotary Cotton City. So we have collected around 400 uh, uh, liters, that is 4 lakh ml of uh, mother's milk from in and around Coimbatore. And we have been pasteurizing, testing it and uh, distributing it to both our NICO babies and babies in outside NICOs. Uh, around 7 to 8 hospitals in the city are uh, uh, getting the services from our milk bank. And uh, so far we have been doing it free of cost also. So uh, this is, was an extended initiative of the breastfeeding support uh, that we provided. And so our mothers started becoming donors within the milk bank itself. I think if there are any other questions, uh, any questions uh, from the audience are welcome and uh, our uh, speakers are uh, ready to answer. If there are no questions, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sharada and uh, Dr. Sujamariam who have uh, taken their time out and uh, participated in this excellent uh, webinar series. And uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Sharada was thanking me for uh, giving this opportunity to her and. Uh, Actually, we are very sorry that uh, we gave you a chance a little late. And uh, definitely we will uh, utilize your services further uh, in a short while. And I thank uh, Dr. Suja also. And uh, an excellent uh, neonatologist, a gift to Sri Ramakrishna Hospital, she is. And, uh, I thank uh, all the participants uh, who have logged in uh, into this seminar, webinar, and um, probably this is one of the well-attended uh, webinars uh, in recent times with uh, maximum number of uh, participants. I thank our marketing department headed by Mr. Murali and uh, other staffs who have uh, uh, put in their efforts to make this uh, webinar a success. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I request the participants to log off. Uh, Murali? Sir, sir, thank you, sir. Uh, you can log off. Uh, you can, uh, sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh,